surroundings today of the Miskin Manor when I'm doing a gardening talk. And I mean, I've heard of Richie's around, but apparently he's gone off to the vegetable garden. So shall we go and see if we can find him then? Vegetable patch at Miskin Manor. So Terry's wax lyrical about this vegetable patch that these guys have started up to supply some of their catering needs in their wonderful house that's set behind us. Uh, January's never a good time to see any vegetable patch, really. I mean, you can imagine it's in a slight state of dereliction, but I wanted to get an idea of why they've done what they've done here. At first glance, it's quite a small plot. And, uh, and I think there's obviously a traditional veggie gardener uh, been playing his part in cultivating this. Uh, and I just want to show you why I think that might be the case. I bet you can't guess what's going on here. There's obviously uh, the uh, framework on which they grow their peas. It's a really good idea, in fact, because this stock-proof fencing, offcuts of stock-proof fencing, you can pick up here and there, friendly farmers, so on and so forth. And it does provide a really uh, versatile, robust climbing frame for peas. You can plant a lot of peas. There's a lot of weight can hang off that fencing without fear of it sort of falling down. So I think that's it's obviously what's going on here. And they probably left it in place as a permanent structure. You can grow peas in the same place every year, uh, although perhaps less than you uh, you would feel comfortable growing beans in the same place. Um, and on the point of beans, I want to show you something that I never ever do. This is the classic bean trench. I remember as a kid, Dad was digging this enormous great trench. It's, you know, it's, it's almost like a, a huge graveyard for several people. Mounting the earth on the side and filling it up with all sorts of potato peelings and cat litter and all sorts of stuff. It's remarkable he used to want to go in a bean trench. Well, exactly what's going on here, really. I mean, obviously their their gardener has dug onto this great big trench and piled all the soil on the uh, onto the left-hand side. And I think, in principle, and certainly you know traditionally, this is, this is always what's happened. You know, and, and if you talk to Albie on Terry's allotment, Albie will always say the best beans come off the back of filling a wonderful deep trench with lots of leaf litter and newspaper underneath to retain all that moisture. And it works. You know, it does work. But I, I on balance. I would say not to bother because it's such an enormous amount of work gone into it. And if you look at the, the, the disturbance that's gone along in that soil as well, there's excavation that occurred in the vegetable patch. I mean, I know cultivation does tend to take its toll. You know, you're bound to disturb a uh, certain kind of working uh, microbial life in the soil off the back of digging and the likes, but this is taking things to the extreme. <laughs> Anyway, I'm sure they'll have a fantastic run of beans and Terry will come out and say, Oh, it's a lovely bean trench. It's just not as good as my bean trench, but lovely nonetheless. We've snuck inside out of the hailstorm because it's uh, a little bit blowy out there. But it just goes to show what you can do in a relatively small space and the extent to which you can grow your vegetable patches. That area will be improved upon and uh, extended year on year and that wonderful fertile virgin soil will provide a host of juicy vegetables for the, uh, the guests that are lucky enough to dine here. Terry Snow, he's gone in, he's doing his talk. Liv, uh, that's you, is going to go and do some filming in a minute. And uh, I've heard it all before, so I'm going to head off outside and have a stroll around the, uh, the estate grounds and uh, see all the other nooks and crannies this fabulous place has to hold for a visitor. I'll see you. Bye. <laughs> I know exactly what I'm going to grow year on year because I plant the same amount of each vegetable because we know that will last us through a season. And that's what it looks like when all stuck together as a large pile. So we never buy veg ever in our house. You have to accustom your palate to what you're going to eat at the time of year. And you have to garden for 12 months of the year. And this is the middle of March on my allotment. And you can see in the background the remnants of a few leeks and the remnants of a few swedes. So we're still eating off the plot. 
And at the same time, out has gone by broad beans. So we, we are continually going on. The only time we find a difficulty and the only time we can slim in our house is sort of second week in April to the first week in May when the food runs desperately low. <laughs> and again, one of the best parts of my house is the airing cupboard. <laughs> For two months of the year, I'm the boss in my house. I'm the boss in my house. From the end of January till the end of March, early April, that is the most finest place to propagate anything because then you see everything gets uniformly warm. Don't leave it in there too long because it's, it gets leggy. As soon as you see any stirring of action in the top of the compost, yeah. get it out, put it somewhere reasonably warm, but get it out before it goes leggy. Onions! 305 onions. Oh. All in the bin. Uh, yeah. the we still use them in the land, but uh, I mean, downy mildew was a real problem last year, wasn't it? I'm growing Santero this year, which is a downy resistant seedling, which I'm trying. I did have some go last year, and I used them up quickly, but the situation is that they, uh, it was a bad season for dry and we didn't have any dry weather whatsoever in the summer. But we are still using onions at the moment, but I did have, we did have a couple early on where we had to use them quickly because they did have a downy building. Yeah. And I grow mainly, I always mainly grown from sets and I always mainly grown stewed on. And in the background there, you can see that in the last two or three rows, one is red barren from seed and a couple of rows of calci there, so I also grow some new seed as well to give me a mix. But I don't think people lose with onions. An onion should be available almost 12 months of the year. I do grow the winter ones, which should come at the end of May, but they're usually June. But then this is about the second week in July, and you can see they are starting to swell quite nicely. You don't have to wait for that green leaf to go back. As soon as you want an onion, go and pull them and use them. Don't, you know, use them as you go along. So all through July and August, you're using onions which are not yet ready to store it. But then, and then when, they, when they take them up, then, you can string them up and put them in the shed if you can properly dry them, which has been difficult in the last couple of years. In a cool, dry shed, they will go till the following April. So you can, you should, you should have onions almost around the clock from your garden, <coughs> from being stored and from being grown. It becomes my secret remedy. And in there go all the leaves. And after about three weeks, I stir that up constantly. And it makes the most smelliest evil broth you could ever make. <laughs> and I take it out of there neat, and I water it on all my brassicas, and then along comes that cabbage white, and he goes down, and he says, my God, this bit stinks, and he goes and lays his head. <laughs> and he put it on neat, it's wonderful. That You obviously haven't tried this. No. I can see that. But it's a, it's a dead giveaway, see, because when you put your hand into the drum and you pull it out, you constantly get them covered in rhubarb juice. You do that twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> right? it's a, it, it, that's the secret of uh, keeping that on there, you know, when it keeps it on there. The only problem you've got is twofold. It stays grey and you have to sleep lower. <laughs> But then, being on a Welsh mountain side when the ground is empty, it used to stand empty because the winters were cold and dry and they now very mild and wet. And I sow green manures, which is a mixture of vetches and rice, and that's the stuff that goes all the nutrients into the soil and improves the soil fertility. And I've just I've literally dug that in within the last week now, so it's all, it takes about five weeks to break down before you can plant again. But the, the, the rye owes all the nutrients as air. The veggies make nitrogen from the air and improve the nitrogen content of your soil considerably. Where does comfrey stand? Comfrey is brilliant. The only trouble is comfrey is where the hell you grow it because once it's on your plot, it's like mint, it runs everywhere. But the leaves of comfrey are brilliant when That's steeped and hung as a feed. It's high nitrogen feed. It is brilliant stuff. I just tear it up and chuck it into a 40 gallon drum, I do. Yeah, brilliant. And then use that. So that's some fantastic natural feed. Oh, that okay. and nettles do exactly the same. But come, come for is where you grow it because it's a bit of a thug, well, isn't it? We're lucky we've got it contained. You are, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it does. It becomes a thug. Yes. But it's, it's a, in a natural fit order of things, it's brilliant. Well, three years ago, Andy and I were coming back from the dinner on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. And as we came along that stretch of road there, yeah. there was a poor hedgehog laying on the side, being oh. hit by a car. Yeah. <laughs> and he, so I picked him up, and he was still alive. So we yeah. thought we'd take him home and see what we could do. So we put him in the boot. We put him in the shed in a little box, we fed him, yeah. cut food and looked after him well, Revived and him. he was brilliant. So I took him up the allotments and I didn't go on my plot, I thought he's off now. No, no, he stayed on my plot. And he looked after the slugs, he ate them all. Yeah. So the rumour spread to the valley, that Terry had a pet hedgehog who was keeping his plot free of slugs. <laughs> so Les, Les now from Chalky Allotments came down, he said, yeah, he said, are you doing an hedgehog and it keeps you a plot free of slugs, he said. I said, yeah, he's brilliant. I want to sell him? He said, I'll give you 50 quid for it. He <laughs> said, no way, Les. I said, this there, John, he's a family pet now. He's doing a great job. No way you buy it. 
Yeah, you know, his life happens, and three days later he died. Yeah. Oh. 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 So I thought, right, I bring up Les. I said, Les, do you still want to buy that edge up? <laughs> yes, he said, go to do. I said, well, send the 50 quid down, I'll send him up. Oh. <laughs> I put it in a box, and I down them the 50 quid. Three days later, I don't know where I'm going to upset him. I better ring him up and apologize. But I got up and said, Les, you know that edge up was dead? Yeah, he said. I know that, he said. I said, do you want any money back? No, no, keep it, he said. I said, really keep it. He said, well, I took him up a lot once in the box, he said. And he said, no, no, he said, I, he told him I bought Teddy's head job, who was famous. And he said, uh, I said, Robert, take us 10 points each, he said. <laughs> I sold 50, he said. And he said, um, he went to surprise. I said, well, didn't nobody complain? Ah, oh, he said, the broker bought him. He said, well, give him his tenner back. <laughs> Yeah, I always do. It's great working with people and they're all great audiences. Great to sort of let it all flow and get the feedback. I bet you've got lots of um, stories to tell from talks and going on, going around and about and doing all the things you get up to. Yeah, you are. I mean, and again, everyone is different. I mean, you get there and no talk works without an audience participation. You, it's no good lecturing to people. And the, the, all you've got to do as well is make the element of fun in it. And some of my rubbishy jokes I throw in from the time to time. So every now and again, you've got to lift them with a laugh and then go back to it. But yeah, it's great. And I, 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 I talk from anything from a room of five people in a gardening club at the top of the roll you know, on the, to the Lincolnshire, the Lincolnshire Theatre with over 400 in it. So it's just, it varies from time to time. But I'm 20 to 30. It's a good sized group to talk to. How many talks do you do a year on average? Um, Probably about 70. 70? Seven, seven all. Seven zero a year? Yeah. That's actually, that's much more than I thought. That's, that's a high volume of talks. Yeah, it's, a, it's on average about one and a half a week. And where do you, where, are they predominantly in Wales? Or they no, 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 the, 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 the big, big major one I do, maybe one or two a week, are the WAs. I'm saying to be the darling of the WAs for some reason. If you go and do a good talk, then the word spreads rapidly throughout the group. And they, when they meet at their group meetings, they say, oh, if you want a speaker, this is the one you want. So they get in touch with me. I mean, last year I did 35 WAs. But most of them tend to be local. When I say local, within a 25 mile radius. But then up and down the country, gardening clubs, they'll go anywhere. I mean, I've been to Sheffield, I've been to Lincoln, I've been over to Bedford, I've been down well into Suffolk. So anywhere and everywhere. I've got a couple coming off next month, one in Redditch and one in Leamington Spa. So, yeah. And that's mainly, they come mainly through radio too. So if people want to see you, the likelihood is that you're going to be coming to a, a cinema screen near them almost, like thing, a theatre near them. <laughs> well, hopefully, I mean, I, it all depends, as I said. You know, it, it, and again, some of them now, I'm going back twice, so obviously they couldn't believe how bad it was first time around. <laughs> this talk that you've just done this afternoon, I noticed you gave Anthea quite a lot of jit. Do you get in trouble when you get home? Absolutely, yes, yes. I'm, I'm probably, I, if I'm lucky, I'm in the back bedroom. Tonight. If not, I'm in the shed. <laughs> well, thanks for joining me in the Skin Manor. I hope you've had a good time as well as I have. But next month, come and join me back on my hillside where we shall be springing into action and the allotments shall be bringing forth in the spring. Mm -hmm.